I know I talked to you about engineering because it is absolutely, positively my love and my passion. And talk to you a little bit about some things, especially to the women in the audience. Um, I'm one of those that helped break the ground because the first day of class in September 2003, I walked in in blue jeans and a pink sweatshirt. And my first professor says to me, what? You're here just to get an uh, MRS and marry off one of these hot engineers? I'm going, well, how do you do? This is going to be a long five years here. So things have obviously changed, sort of. Because many of you, when you begin to graduate, how many of you are seniors going to graduate in the next six months? How many of you are juniors? OK, things are going to be changing. The economy is changing, trust me. Um, depends on who you vote for here in, in, in uh, November. But that's your choice. But let's talk a little bit about engineering. And let me tell you a little bit about me. I was not the smartest kid in my high school class. I went to um, high school over in St. Petersburg, Dixie Hollins. Graduated kind of in the upper group. The brains of our class was a guy named Richard Guida, a true, by definition today, geek, um, really computer wizard. I was kind of really good in math and science, and my mother was praying that I would be a math teacher and go to USF, because it was right down the street. And I said, Mom, don't think so. Um, did some research, found about this college that was opening up here in Orlando, and we drove over together. My parents came over here, and there was a very big, after we passed Orlando, it was an Air, Air Force base. Those of you that don't know, the airport was an Air Force base with B-2 bombers out of here. Drove through there. When you got to the end of the base, 436 did not exist. It was a two-lane dirt road through cow pastures. Came up here, and my mother says, where do you think you're going to college? And we kept driving, and Millican's Pond that's out here in front of the admin building was a big mud pie. I mean, huge dirt, OK? And we came and we talked. There was this man standing there with his foot up on the bench, smoking this pipe, just looking at this hole in the ground. There was only the admin building and the library building. That was all that was really here at that time. Turned around and said, um, I said, is this going to be the new engineering, the newest state-of-the-art engineering college, Florida Technological University, Space Coast, big space program back then? Um, and he said, yep. He says, that's what this is going to be. And we asked his name, and it was Dr. Milliken, um, who was sitting out there. And we sat and talked. And he said, you know, engineering is going to be one of the major colleges in this university. We're going to grow it. We're going to do all this partnership. I was sold. So this is where I came. We were a small college at the time. Uh, education was bigger. Business was bigger. But the engineering group uh, was here. And when I got here, probably the first two years, you know, your basic courses, your general engineering courses, but at that time, people that were in my class, most of them were transients living in town, coming out here. But most of them were, were uh, vets from the Vietnam War that were coming back. So they were much older than me. And I'm sitting there after two years. And these guys, you know, they'd been in the military. They'd maintained tanks. They'd done all this stuff. And I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, you know, knew nothing in common with them. The space program was starting to die. You know, and my advisor told me to switch to mechanical engineering. I couldn't compete with any of these guys. I said, I'm done. I want out of engineering. My dreams are shattered. Don't want to go here. I can't compete with these guys. And so I went to Dean Kirsten at the time, and he told me, he says, yeah, he says, I'll sign it for you. He says, but you're the one that's been complaining with the student body of how bad the dorms have been designed for women. You've been complaining about all these problems. So the only way you're going to make a difference is if you stay and fight it out. You know, yeah, it's going to be tough, but you've got to decide if it's in you to be able to go do it. So I stayed, and I am now um, run a 950 engineers work for me, a $1.8 billion program, the F-35 program that I've been working on for 19 years to go win it and build it. And we build all the support equipment, the stuff, the yellow gear you see around commercial airplanes. The training system that build for the pilots and maintainers to train them how to fly the jet, how to maintain the jet. The pilot flight equipment that protects um, the pilots as they uh, fly the jet. 
and all the information system, the information technology that connects it. So we have a lot of work to do and have a lot of engineers and a lot of them are graduates from here because you guys have the newer technologies. It takes a long time to design an airplane like that. It takes a long time for technology to merge into a new product. But if you go out to computer companies and you look at the chip industry, things are turning every 18 months. So you can imagine on a 19-year development program that we've been working on, how many times technology is turned over. So we hire a lot of the young engineering graduates because you guys are sitting there with your pulse on the latest technology. The funniest thing, though, is with my generation, I walk around all the cubicles, Cubicle City over at Lockheed, and you turn around, and you guys, three monitors, iPad, iPhone, you know, going at the same time in their ears, texting somebody else, I have no idea what you're doing. I can only do one at a time. So I commend you all. I mean, to me, it's information overload and data overload right now. Just give me one thing at a time and I will do it. But you walk in and see all of you. So, but that's an important thing that you're gonna have to learn how to manage, okay? Because you could get too much information from too many different places. And you've got to be able to be the filter for all that in knowing what you're doing. When I graduated from here, um, I went to work for the Navy. I had five job offers at the time, only because everybody had to fill the quota of a woman engineer. It was a mandate, it was a law, they had to hire women. I had a job offer from automotive industry in Detroit, from um, insurance companies doing investigations for fire hazards all over the place, all over the map. But I picked the lowest paying job right down the street here at Naval Training Equipment Center to build simulators for pilots and maintainers and things like that because it seemed like a really exciting challenge. And I kind of took that. It seemed like it would be interesting. First day on the job, walked in, just excited. I had my degree, five years, no more homework, no more professors, a real paycheck that I can spend my own money on. And I turned around and walked in, and the vice president says, you're only here to fill a quota, okay? <laughs> so go sit in the corner. Talk about going home and crying my eyes out. You know, that was the most expensive paycheck of crying for five days that I'd ever seen. You're going to run into people like that, okay? And you need to understand that. But then it's up to you. I could have sat there, taken what he said, sat in a corner and done nothing whatsoever. I would not be where I am today. I decided, I, the more I thought about it, the angrier I got and turned around and started doing things for people without being asked, without being told. And suddenly, after about four months, people started asking for me to do things. You don't always have to be told what to do. If you're going to be a success as a new young engineer out there, you've got to look for opportunities to help people without being asked or told and expectations and kind of work through the system because there's all sorts of companies and corporations out there, okay? Lockheed, we use more what's called integrated product team. We're building something, you need electrical engineers and you need software engineers and you need mechanical engineers and you need the test group. You need all of that group to build a product and you need to sit down and talk with each other. I mean, you guys know, those of you that were around in 2004 when we had the hurricanes and we lost power, everything is computerized nowadays. You walk into Publix, they couldn't scan anything because the UPC code is all digital. They had to manually go through books to transfer the number to a price and add it all up manually. So you need the hardware engineers, you need mechanical and electrical engineers because guys, software, I know you guys think, how many of you are software engineers in here? How many of you are hardware and mechanical types? Okay. God love the software engineers, but all those ones and zeros don't do anything unless you have some piece of hardware to, to put it on, okay, to manifest itself into doing something. You know, the iPad is the greatest piece of software that's out there, but unless you had the physical pad in your hand, it's nothing, okay? So software guys, you gotta talk to the hardware guys. And hardware guys, you gotta talk to the software guys because they're, what sells and what makes money for corporations really is the whiz-bang software. I mean, why do you guys pick 
Apple over the Samsung system. It's who's got the best software, who has the best features. But you guys have to work together, okay? If you start working in your own little vacuum, in most companies, that's going to fail, unless the company is so huge that you want to concentrate in just one area. So that kind of gets me back. You come to college, you get your foundation, okay? Then you build up the four walls. The first couple of jobs are your four walls and kind of a roof over the house. It's okay to fail, okay? It's okay to take a job with a company in an area you want and suddenly realize it's not what I want to do. You've got the basic functional areas, electrical, mechanical, environmental, computer systems, all of that. But in every single one of those domains, you have design engineering, you have manufacturing engineering, you have quality assurance engineering, you have test engineering, you have project engineering. So within any of those, I mean, can you imagine the matrix of taking those hardware functional systems and all the different subcategories within there you may not be the best design. You may get hired in to sit at a, at a desk. I was going to say drawing board, but none of you would know what that is. Um, um, I, AutoCAD or something like that, okay? You're sitting there at an AutoCAD machine. It may not be what you like to do. You may have thought so here because you're in a protected, safe environment here, but you get out there in your little cubicle with the AutoCAD system and decide, man, this is boring. You know, I want to go see the product being built. So maybe manufacturing engineering from an electrical or mechanical background is where you should be, okay? So don't be afraid that your first job isn't what you thought has the fire in your belly from what you really thought it would be to once you get out there, because it isn't. I changed four times, okay, before I really found it. My, my specialty was thermodynamics okay, in servo systems and hydraulic systems. Did it, you know, designing it, doing all that, and you know, sitting at that after about five or six months, boring, sorry guys. I wanted to be more hands-on. So I switched more into the integration and test. So we actually had the draft equipment, the prototype equipment, and started checking it out and testing it. And what intrigued me was why did it fail? This guy designed it this way. This guy designed it this way. It should have interfaced together. To me, that was just exciting, trying to figure out why it wasn't working the way each of the individual components thought it was going to be. Then after a period of time, I really decided I liked the engineering management. I found out I had the gift of gab, and I found out that I was able to be more of a jack of all trades. I got the mechanical. I got about that much of electrical except electrical is not my key. I was the first person to destroy the electrical lab here at FTU back then. We actually had the fire department in, so it was the first fire department call here in the College of Engineering way back when. So electrical was not my thing, but I know not to touch it um, and leave it to the experts, but I have that little bit across the board of everything that I could see and understand where it all came together when you were integrating it and putting the schedule and the cost, because most of the companies, many of you are gonna to go to, are profit oriented. They are going to want to make money. That's what big corporations are about. That's what small businesses are about, is to make money. That goes back into your paycheck through stock options and things like that. So what they wanna do is I realized I had the ability to see across the domains and begin to hone in that this really is a software problem or this really is, because some engineers can't see the forest for the trees, so they kind of bring everything together. So I moved into program management and, and engineering, engineering magic, project engineers, um, uh, engineering director, engineering program management type of things, and that's what I've gotten into. That's why my job right now is a director, and I've been doing the F-35 for a long time. However, just three months ago, I left that program and picked up a new line of business that's in serious financial trouble. And the reason it's in financial trouble is because each engineer in that group looked in their own little space and didn't do the cross integration. And systems are failing because the hardware was designed perfectly, but it doesn't play with the software when it got integrated. 
So bringing my skills into this group, we're beginning to try and turn the whole group around. But that's where it really, really does get to be important. So when you get out, you've got to find that where your niche is. It's not the, your textbook and academic environment here is to build that foundation in the four walls. You got to decide yourself how you're going to outfit the house. How many rooms? Where do you want to go? What kind of business? Big business or small business? I've worked at both. In a big business, you are one of many. In a small business, you could probably not only do engineering work, you may be taking out the trash because small companies don't have that kind of money. You got to understand that. That's kind of part of the game and part of the dance that you do in small businesses. I've been in government and I've been in, in uh, the private sector here. In the government, the government's got different agencies that do research and development, they do acquisition. You got to find the right niche in the government if that's what you're interested in doing. If you're going to uh, the industry side, you've got to decide big product oriented or service oriented. And a lot of service organizations right now are looking for that type of background too, of engineers to help them figure out where they need to go, what their product line's gonna be, how they're gonna maintain and repair equipment out there. So you've got a lot of decisions. So the, the biggest thing and the biggest item I see for the young engineers we hire after a couple of months, they walk in my office and I just can't do this. It's not that you can't. You have the learning and the education. You're just not in the right place you need to be yet. So we move some people around to find out what their real niche is. Because if you manage to get through four to five years of the academic program here at UCF, I guarantee you're a good engineer, okay? I have no qualms about that. It's just fitting you into what meets your needs and your demands when you get out there in the real world. So don't be afraid. I mean, I've had several, several engineers walk in that they weren't fit to be an engineer. You're just not there, okay? So you gotta take that and don't consider it a failure. You're just not in your niche yet. It, like I said, it took me three years to find my niche. So give yourself some time. Um, some of the other things, um, I have this list of questions. See, I had homework too. They gave me homework. These were the questions that I guess you all kind of sort of generated there. So I just kind of wanted um, to get through. Um, one of the other questions in here is, what does leadership mean to me? Um, probably in my experience, leadership is to get a team focused to build something at the end of the day whether it's build, develop, design, to take everybody together and lead a team. You can't do people's job for them. You're not a leader, okay? You can't sit here and talk to people and kind of walk them around and show them what to do. You're not a good leader. You've got to lay expectations, lay out a time frame, tell them what needs to be done, but when you tell them, you've got to get buy-in. You know how your mom may have told you to go clean your room when you were young? Did you want to? How many of you did? There wasn't buy-in on your part to what your mother asked you to go do. It's the same with engineers. You get a group of people together, you get a team together, and you say, in six months, I gotta go build this piece of support equipment that's gonna stop the aircraft when you park it and put it, okay? But you've got all these people, you've gotta have those plans and those expectations sitting up front. This is the time frame. this is how much money, this is what we need to do. Is everybody buying into the time, the dollars, the budget, the design? Do you understand the requirements? If people don't buy in to begin, you're not gonna make it. You're gonna take longer. You're gonna spend more money. So the other thing that young engineers, don't say yes because you're afraid to question yourself. If you think somebody comes and tells you, I need you, I need you to go build me a prototype uh, circuit board, okay? And he turns around and says, um, I need it done in two hours. Do you think you could really design a circuit board in two hours? Okay, probably not. So I would tell them, you know, I, I understand your need on the time frame. I understand the project urgency. I don't believe that I can meet that time frame. I think I can do it in about a week with some help and some mentoring. Because if you say yes, you've established an expectation by your peers or people around you. You may not know something that maybe they haven't told you that there's a financial penalty if they don't meet that date. 
people don't tell you everything, okay, when you get out into big industry. So you need to ask and question, is there a deadline? Is there ramifications if I don't meet that? You need to be honest with yourself, with your capabilities. But the most important thing is, I was going to say this backwards here. I always do this. What does I say? Um, underestimate and overachieve. I put the over and under backwards half the time. Okay? So if you sit there and think that it's going to take you three days, maybe add a little day. Take four days. So you're, you're over-promising something, and then when you do it faster, you're looked at as a success instead of, oh, he wants it this quick, I'll do it, and you stay up all night, and you fall asleep, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you're late. You haven't succeeded in people's eyes, okay? So kind of just be able to sit out there and really under-promise and over-achieve. Sit down there and, and work through all that in your mind when someone tells you to do something. I mean, you're managing your own schedule right now for homework. How many of you meet your requirements on your deadlines for homework? You know, <laughs> I see a few hands, but I saw some. I did. I really did. Okay. But you got to stop and think. You got to plan your day now. Start planning that. Set yourself some timelines and see how long it takes you. And did you meet those? Because when you get out in industry, that's what it's going to be. There are timelines because time is money in most big industries and corporation. You know, there's millions. The little pieces build up to bigger, and when you delay, you know, the cost, the investors, the stockholders, and all that. Small companies, too. Small companies have stockholders, and they're financially strapped nowadays. So you need to kind of, you know, watch all of that and understand um, where those risks are yourself. Um, when people come in for a job interview, you know, what do I look for in a new engineer when I sit down there and, um, and interview them? I truly do understand grades. Been there, done that. You know, you have to study and you have to make grades. But I am not necessarily in the line of business we do looking for that absolute, I think you guys have passed the 4.0. Isn't there something now, 5.0 or something that's in here? But three? Not looking for the, all the best of grades. I mean, I'm not looking for, you know, someone that says that they're um, a, a brain surgeon and all they had was an elementary education degree, all right? We're looking for that relative place out there as to some decent grades that you've passed, people that are well-rounded that have worked on teams and worked interaction. Because like I said, most companies nowadays do integrated product teams. You bring teams together to talk about an issue, to talk about problems, okay? So you sit around the table and talk through all of that. So have you worked in a team before? Have you worked in a, in a club, even club or organizations? Have you been on a sports um, team? Even an inter intramural one, many of us can't get to that competitive level. But have you worked as a team? Do you belong to organizations where you have to interact with people to achieve a goal? Most of the times those are the types of questions I ask because I need to figure out how are you going to fit in sitting at a table with other engineers, are you going to sit there like a bump on a log and not contribute because you're too afraid to say something? Or do you have the energy to interact with people? Okay, That's what design work, development work, engineering work is. I mean, I can tell you the, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Eiffel Tower, you know, they weren't done by a person by themselves in a vacuum. It took groups of people. It took the designers. It took the manufacturing team. It took the material guys. So it's an integrated. So that's what you got to think about, you know, trying to get in something um, that we talk about that we can work through and talk through. And you can explain to me some history. You know, I may ask you things like, tell me about a time when you were involved with a group where there was um, conflict. Tell me about, I mean, it could have been in class. Someone in here can stand up and argue with me right now. That would be fine. Just tell me about a time you know, when you um, had to take the lead because nobody in the room was doing something. You know, those are the kinds of questions I ask to find out about you. I have the piece of paper that has your academics on it. I know you have a degree from a good university, but when I'm interviewing, I want to know about you and how are you going to play into it. But if you don't get the job, go back and ask the person why, because most of the time, 
They're trying to find a specific instance of a specific type of person with a specific type of background to fit into a job that's existing. There's a vacancy. Someone left, someone retired. They got to fill that. So don't take a rejection personally either because when I'm looking at things like that, we do have holes, we have vacancies that we've got to go fill. And some of the answers to the questions may not have fit into that, okay? Um, the other thing is you've applied for a job. We sit down, do you have any questions? How many of you, how many of you have been on an interview yet? Okay. And how many of you did the uh, interviewee ask you, do you have any questions? And how many of you answered with a question? Okay, guys, you've taken the time and the effort to apply for this job. You've probably gotten dressed up, okay, in clothes you normally don't wear, and they're probably very uncomfortable. You're probably very scared, okay? You're trying to make a good impression, all right? So just pre-plan one question. Just, I went, I keep, you mean you have no questions for me? Absolutely none, you know? You worried about all this? Just think of a question. A good question for any situation is, am I gonna have a mentor? Is there somebody that's gonna help me through my first six months of being a new engineer with this company? Very good, simple question. One question, that's all I ask, just one question? I mean, I've sat here and I talked to these people for 30 minutes, an hour, we walk them through, not a single word, okay? So just think of a couple of generic questions like that. Does my job require travel? Okay, just some very basic, just keep them in your hip pocket because you're gonna be so nervous, you know, you're not gonna remember something. Just write it down on your piece of paper or something. Just one question to know that you're alive and that you're listening, okay? when we're talking to you. It really, really does help, okay? Because I really would like to hear your voice other than when I first meet you and hear your name and I don't hear another word from you, you know, most of the time. So just come up with a question. Check into the company. You know, you know I understand the company has five divisions. Where does this one fit in the organization? It has nothing to do with your job, but it says that you're involved. You got interest in what you're going to go do, okay? Uh, let's see. What is the best part of my job? The paycheck. <laughs> and if anybody else tells you something different, they're lying. <laughs> Otherwise, you unfortunately may have gone to be a teacher like my mother did because unfortunately they don't get paid very well, you know. But engineering pays well, okay? And it is a nice perk to the job, all right? But in all seriousness, the best part of the job for me is really creating something. 11 years ago when we won the F-35, I was sitting in the auditorium like this. We were waiting for the announcement up in, up in um, DC, whether it was us or Boeing. You know, and I'd worked on the program for five years doing the preliminary design. I had my whole team of 200 people in the room at that time. We've obviously grown since then. And when they announced the winner is, and they said Lockheed Martin, you know, I kind of sat there, and then I went, oh shit, now we gotta make it work, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, so it, it, it's that kind of reality. So when you, the best part of a job is no matter what you're doing, you're gonna have to make it work. You're gonna have to build it, you're gonna have to maintain it, you're gonna have to support it, whatever your field is, you're going to have to make it do something, okay? You don't get to sit back there, draw a piece of paper and flip it because at the other end, there's somebody's gotta build it. And trust me, I can't tell you how many times you sit out there at the other end when somebody has it, and you guys know this, you go to the store and you buy some TV that doesn't work. Well, who the hell built this? You know, were they idiots, you know? You can't reach this plug, you have to do upside down flips to get in the back to turn this. You know that, but that could be you they're talking about someday. And so, you know, they're gonna little little daggers in you that they're not, you're not even gonna know that they're talking about you. So stop and think about the person at the other end that you're really building it for, because that's what your job is as an engineer. Environmentally, mechanically, hardware-wise, whatever it is, you know, you have to do something. I mean, that's what we're in here for. 
We're here to go build. I mean, that's the fun part of this job. I know you're not doing much of that yet, but trust me, you will, okay, when you get out here. Check my time. Um, let me say a couple more things, and then I'll open it up for some questions. Um, how do I get the most from my UCF classes? Are there any professors in the room? Can you leave the room, please? <laughs> that probably would not work. Um, to get the best, I mean, we really had to work together. We formed little study groups. You can read a book. Oh, you probably don't read books now, do you? It's all on computers. <laughs> Man, I am archaic here. You can't sit there and look at your computers all the time and, and read text. Engineering is a, is a living thing, you know. It, it has moving parts. It's got all these pieces to it. It's like the spoke of a wheel. The only way you're truly going to get benefit from a class, from the experience here, is to sit with some other people that are in your class, your group, maybe somebody from the outside. Call up somebody that's been, you know, and there's the College of Engineering Alumni Association. I mean, the group of us, you know, are always out here willing to, to go help. We've been there. We've been in your shoes. Everybody that's been out there. But get a group together to study on the classes. Ask each other questions. Because engineering sometimes is not an exact science, you know. You sit here and you look at it one way and you look at it another and you can get different views of things. So get small groups together and just go over your study groups for tests. Um, go over some homework and talk with each other um, so that you start getting different ideas. Because a lot of things in engineering, sometimes there's no wrong answer. It's just your approach to it. How did I approach the solution to this problem? And there's lots of ways to approach solutions to problems. You go look at how many different varieties of TVs are out there, how many different varieties of cell phones. If there was only one solution to every problem, there would be a monopoly on cell phones. There would be a monopoly on design of houses. You know, so there's lots of ways to get to the end design as we sit there um, and, and kind of look at some of those um, things. But that's probably the best way I got the most of it. I mean, I, like I said, I hate to read, you know, when we use the textbooks here. So we got groups, just sat around and just talked and, and worked through the answers together. Um, how about, let's see what other questions I have here. How did I land my first job? I think I talked about that. Um, what are the job prospects for engineers? I would tell you right now, Lockheed Martin has a significant um, shortage in um, network engineering, um, computer systems architecture, uh, some hardware engineering as it relates to um, things like environmentals, electro, uh, EMI, elect electromagnetic, I'll think of the IC, you get old and you just use the letters and then forget what they stand for, electromagnetic interference, you know, EMI specialist. So you start kind of going through all of those different areas and we try and bring in, right now we're having a major design problem on a um, bar. Um, the new group I have is called Live Training where it teaches the young soldiers and we do this for people countries around the world. They, sh they shoot um, pistols, rifles, M16 machine guns, shoulder launch missiles, tanks, and they use live ammo and they shoot at targets and it teaches them how to be accurate. Well, we designed the accuracy system on these targets that says how accurate each of these students are as they're going through before they deploy overseas to Afghanistan. And we're having a problem that that sensor bar is not sensing the accuracy because the sensors are failing. Okay, so we brought them back in and we have spent now two weeks trying to analyze why are these sensors not working, okay? And we got a, a root cause analysis, brought a bunch of different engineers in, and after two weeks, it ended up that a little sensor, no bigger than my pinky here, the supplier, a third tier supplier that built that, changed his manufacturing process, changed the epoxy, okay, and the epoxy material that is being used in there, you know, had some issues with it. It was getting contaminated as they were building it up. So you can see how two and three tiers down, just changing a process that caused some contamination, you know, ended up coming in and causing us, Lockheed, at the end, to fail in front of our customers. 
So it's those types of things that, that you can see that you got to stop and sit back. It, it may not be you. It may not be your first tier supplier. But in the commodity market we have, everything we have comes from someone else all the way down the tree. And the problem could be way several steps back from where you are. So you got to think about that. It may not just be you or your design or something you've worked on or something your team. You got to look at the whole environment. Those of you that may be familiar with the um, Challenger accident, a multi-billion dollar space program, and what, for an O-ring that the temperature environment was not looked at, how it expanded and contracted, you know. It's those little things that will get you as you're an engineer. And that's what we owe our customers and our products to be able to do that as thorough engineers. I think I've kind of talked enough. I mean, I can yeah. keep talking here, but uh, either they're falling asleep or they got lots of questions so or they want lunch. I heard lunch is out there. Probably all the above. All the above. Know. But I could ask the first set of questions. Uh, and not I am, fair. Yeah, but I am nervous, so I wrote them down as well, right? Okay. So you started with about gray hair. Yeah. So these folks are going to go work. Right. Some in a couple months, some a little okay. longer. But they're going to get gray hairs too. Yeah. So what about them being an engineer is going to give them gray hairs, right? Because they're out in the real world. Well, as they're walking that workplace, how are they going to get gray hairs? What's going to... You're, you're going to get... My first gray hair came. I was the chief engineer for the development on the government side for the Aviate B aircraft. And the very first flight, when they start flying, you know, you take all this, you do all the flight tests, and you got the test pilots, and the test pilots are great. They understand the aircrafts are instrumented. The first time you take all that test instrumentation off, and you don't have a test pilot, and you put a regular fleet pilot that came through, just like you saw, um, you know, going through Top Gun and all that, they get out there and start flying that very first airplane out in the fleet, and he takes off, and it's daylight, and everything's hunky-dory. <gasps> Sigh of relief, thank goodness, right? Then we got the clearance to start flying at night. And you get the 2.30 in the morning phone call. Joanne, we've lost an airplane somewhere over the no, uh, Long Island Sound. Don't know what happened. There was a big ball of fire and we can't find the pilot. And it's, oh my God, did something I do, my team do, that caused a failure after such a short period of time. You get up, you know, you go in trying to, you know, Starting the investigation, the military starts the, the search for the pilot and, and the aircraft director and all that. And it took about, you know, three days to try and locate him and, and just lots of reasons why and, and the wreckage and everything because it went obviously in the water over, over the sound. But it's things like that. When something really truly goes wrong, you know, with what you're doing. But even though my first reaction was, what did we do? My second reaction is we got to protect the rest of everybody else out there and we need to find the cause of this so we don't potentially, I mean, he was safe at the end of the day, but you've got to decide in those jobs that you have that there may be risk. Um, currently, the gray hair is coming from the group I just took over a few months ago pretty much has lost millions and millions of dollars for the corporation. Okay, you have all these other programs that did so well that made all this profit for the company, and then these programs that I just took over, they weren't run right, they weren't making the right decisions, and they lost all that profit. You know, it's not fair to the other team that, that worked that this comp loss here comes off of them because the company can only make so much. And so my fear now is trying to get this team rejuvenated, fix the procedures, fix the processes, because you can't keep losing money. The company will shut this group down. I got a lot of engineers whose jobs are on the line, a lot of people whose work in the manufacturing line, customers that if we shut it down would be disappointed. It's those kinds of things, but that's kind of more me now and more of the management role. But you, as you get older and grayer, will be in there somewhere, either technically or in engineering management. And that's where you just, as you raise up, that's where the responsibility falls. And that's the real me is all gray. So responsibility gives us gray hairs. It does. Stress. Stress to responsibility. To just for getting old. Okay. <laughs> You're obviously not old. Is he old? Huh? I feel old. You feel old. I feel old. Okay. Questions? Yeah. Is that typically still a problem? Pardon? Is that typically still a problem? Um 
in the generation, my generation and younger, I would probably tell you no, because we've kind of broken those barriers. I do work for people who are still probably five and 10, 15 years older than me that still have some old philosophies. Companies and corporations do not tolerate that discrimination across anything, whether it, it's um, sexual, race, disabilities, um, ethnic origin, none of that is tolerated anywhere um, in, in places. There are people, though, sometimes that one or two things will come out, okay? And it's up to you and your individual character as to what you want to do about it, okay? There's no right or wrong answer, okay? Going to tell your supervisor, it is not tolerated in corporations anymore. I can flat out tell you that. Any discrimination of any sort, harassment is not tolerated anywhere. So your decision to notify your supervisor, to notify your ethics, um, and those are all kept quiet, you know, that is between you and your supervisor. I strongly recommend my team to make sure and tell me anything like that. Bad joke that was offensive, things like that. And I go immediately to the person, get the two of them to sit down and understand, and it's settled. If it continues, then there's more serious action that's taken place, okay? But I can't tell you it's all gone, all right? It's not a perfect world out there yet. Another five or 10 years when people my age that had to go through all that start moving up and probably another couple of years when you get out, it'll be fine. But things aren't perfect out there. There are people that a lot of times, you may get fired from a job and you're not gonna know. Guys, there's people you're gonna work for that just are not going to like you. I have been fired three times in my career because the people I work for did not like me. I was too outspoken, I knew, I knew more than they did, you know, so, hey, join the club, it's okay to be fired, you know? It makes you better and stronger. You know, I mean, unless you're fired for something, you know, unethical, um, you know, major violations, but if you're doing a good job, you're gonna realize that sometimes there's people that just aren't gonna like you. You're parting your hair on the wrong side of your head. They don't like that. You have this twitch, they don't like that they will find a way to get rid of you. Is it firing? Is it reassigning you somewhere else because they don't want, they call it what they want. But it's okay, it's not that you're a failure. Oh my God, you know, would you call, I don't call myself a failure. I'm running a $1.8 billion program with 950 people, but I've been fired three times. <laughs> it happens. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the revolution of communication technology? If I had 100 communication technologists right now would solve half my problems. Most of the work we're doing in this live training area is done through, most of the countries we sell this are third world countries right now. They don't have good electrical infrastructure, so we're doing everything wireless through cell phones, through small antennas, and putting large antennas out on these ranges, okay? and trying to find people that understand the, the pace at which cellular technology and communications is changing has been difficult. We probably, in my group right now, only have two, and one of them's told me, you know, that maybe he's gonna be retiring in a few years, and I almost panicked here, you know. So that's where, I mean, the electrical grid and infrastructure that's out in a lot of places is getting archaic. It's costing too much to replace it, so a lot of places are trying to see if they can't change communications to network cell towers, taking that same concept and applying it to other industries. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest challenges you uh, received from those two leads and how do you handle those? I'm sorry, I missed one of the words. What's the biggest challenge I received? From those two leads. The biggest challenge. Um, Probably there's a couple of them. One's more of a funny one, but it becomes a problem. It's sometimes it's a dress code issue, okay? Um, you guys are ruining my dress code today because I'm supposed to be in jeans. Today is our dress down day at Lockheed. We wear blue jeans and, and school colors. So, you know, I, I got told I had to dress up here um, today for this. But that was Robin, by the way. That wasn't that, me. That I would have been in jeans. I yeah. would have been in jeans. I, I, I understand that. There are sometimes some people, you know, especially the eccentric, let's put it that way, that like to dress their own way, 
And you gotta politely gotta figure out how to tell people that. So that's kind of a, a funny one, but it's something that as a manager you gotta deal with because you have customers coming in, you have senior leadership come in. I mean, most companies nowadays are casual, so it's kind of you know slacks and a golf shirt type of thing or an open shirt, you know, with, with jeans. But not the jeans with holes in the knees, you know, or jeans that are torn at the bottom that don't have, you know, it's Guys, that's a little bit too far, okay? Um, probably the, the other biggest challenge I have as a leader is, to me personally, keeping up with technology. Man, it is moving, and I got these young engineers that sit down that come to my office, you know, from one to five years experience that start spouting all this, and you guys are much more, you, you are in, you are just have access to so much information between you know Twitter and Facebook. I don't have any of that. I don't have a Twitter account. I don't have a Facebook account. You know, I don't. You guys have access to so much information. And then I sit in a meeting, and you guys come in and are rattling this. And my biggest problem is how do I, as a manager, translate what you're telling me into something that can be worked? Okay, that can, I can harness. You know. How can I take what you're telling me, harness, and make it valuable to the company? So sometimes when you get out there, you're going to have people that are going to be much older. you got to stop back and think of that generation gap that maybe I need to repackage what I'm saying and doing so that maybe if you get this, what was he saying? I really don't understand. Okay, it may not be what, it may not be how you're saying or anything. It just may be the information that, I can't keep up with all the technology changes in, in network communication, in materials, you know, in processing procedures and all of that. So you're gonna get people like that. So that's my biggest challenge is trying not to tell you don't tell me about it. And some people will do that. No, the way we're doing it's okay. That's wrong. We really need to find better ways, cheaper, economical, but just trying to figure out how to get the new innovative ideas in in such a way that the program can accept it and people can accept it and the product can accept it because I'm not, I call myself technically challenged sometimes. Um, I actually had a question about uh, among your female engineers, what do you see is the best way for the younger female engineers to handle trying to start a family and a full-time career at the same time? Uh, we at Lockheed do have a um, kind of a work at home type of program. Um, I have several female engineers and for a period of time there I was afraid there was something in the drinking water and I was going to have another one um, because it went around quite quickly. But the biggest thing is you can do it. I did I did not have, um, I adopted children, okay? So I adopted um, two, two girls, and adoption's a little bit different because you had to be there for them a lot. And the company worked with me. We sat down and said, here's what needs to be. I need to be home at these times. I need to pick them up and, and bring them home and do things like that. And so the company worked with me. I have several female engineers that you get your maternity leave, but they only wanted to work half time for a while or work four days and have an extra day off. And with the computer technology, with the link in from home, you take your computers home, and now Lockheed's just asking people if you want to use your own personal cell phones or pads, they'll put the, the communication system from here on there. It's very easy to do. The F-35 program is being built across 52 different countries around, there, the sun never sets. Pieces of the airplane program and our systems are being built around the world. So if you can build a multi-million dollar aircraft, you know, through computers and technology and Skyping, we Skype with the team, people all the time around the world, you can do that. It's just the company, that's one of the things you need to ask, you know, what's your, what's your situation, you know, how does the, the work at home process work? Many companies are doing that now. We got time for one more question. Is that time already? Yeah. You mentioned creating something, new products and new inventions and stuff like that is the best part about your job. Is there something that you have been always kind of had in the back of your mind that you would love to create, kind of like your dream machine, aircraft, spacecraft, something like that? Would you love to do? Oddly enough, my, my dream was the project I worked on here for my senior design project. Um, I minored in biomedical engineering, 
Okay? I know, what a big mix. I mean, silly, huh? I just, the, the, so I minored in biomedical engineering, and oddly enough, everybody in my family is in the medical business. I, I was the odd one that went to things of mass destruction, you know, <laughs> fighters that kill people, and now live ammunition. Um, but I had designed this kind of, um, I had seen some people, you know, the beds in the hospitals, you know, trying to do a, an air floating bed to keep the bed sores, which is one of the biggest issues with elderly people, you know, especially as Alzheimer's is growing and things like that. And there are a couple of companies, but I don't think it proved as fruitful and cost effective. I mean, I kind of did one back then. Um, it needed a lot of work, you know, because the technology wasn't really there. Is it there today? I don't know. I haven't really looked at it. But that's the one thing in the back of my mind. That was my senior design project, and it would have been nice to try and see if industry had, can really go forward with it. But that has nothing to do with what I'm doing now. You know, see, I went from the humane to the warmonger over here. So you never know what you're going to do. We have an idea for senior design or sophomore prize designing that bed. I know. I'll help. I'll run the senior design project with you. This has been recorded, you know. Oh, I know. Well, just so for your, just for your information, up. just for your information, I've done three senior design products here. I don't know how many of you were here when we were had football at the Citrus Bowl, when we did football games at the Citrus Bowl. There was this little cart that um, Nitro used to drive around because they wouldn't let us do things. It was a senior design project I ran with the mechanical engineering group, and we built that car for Nitro. And then the next year, that, you know, the cheerleading team wanted something for the team to run out because it wasn't ours, so that there was a big castle that went up that the team came out of. That was another design uh, project that we built and did here. So I've done that. I can get my hands dirty. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. you.